Okay, it looks like everybody that is in the waiting room has been admitted. So we're gonna get started and uh, we will go over some nuts and bolts of the call in just a minute. So if you have any questions, let me get to that part and you know who to reach out to. Um, good afternoon and thank you for joining us in these extraordinary times. I'm Mayumi Legato, the publisher of Moonshine Inc. And here on our Tahoe Talks conference calls, the team swaps our reporter hats for convener hats to address pressing community issues. And today we feature the ever important topic of fire season and the additional vexing aspects of the age of coronavirus being layered on top of it. Placer County asked us to partner for this discussion and we are honored to be a part of it. 10 fire and other emergency personnel are on the call today. This is a time to learn, to ask questions, and then after this call, we encourage you to share what you've learned. The Moonshine team is on the line and I'd like them to introduce themselves quickly. I'm Alex Hoft, news reporter. Hi, I'm Becca Lux. I'm the editor for the opinion and news sections. Hi, I'm Juliana Demarest. I'm the arts and culture editor. I thank you for being here today and I do apologize that I will be cutting out early so I'm not just disappearing. And hello, I'm Sarah Miller. I'm graphic design with Moonshine Inc. Thank you guys. Alex, Juliana, and I are your co-hosts today. Um, Becca is fielding technical questions in chat. So if you have any questions and you need any help, she is there for you. Um, Sarah is manning our slideshow and she's gonna keep us on time. So let's get started. As I mentioned, first I wanna walk us through the nuts and bolts and participating in this call with us. To help keep our discussion on point um, and to end on time, we have a few guidelines about participating. Sarah is going to show you with arrows on the screen what I'm talking about as I move forward. First, we ask that everybody mute yourself. We wanna keep background noise from distracting others. Second, we encourage that you use your video because when we keep it personal, I think we keep it real. Next, there's a participants panel, usually at the bottom of your screen. This is where you're gonna raise your hand. And we are asking if you would like to speak that you raise your hand and there is an arrow pointing out that button. There's also down at the bottom, a reactions panel. If you wanna applaud someone or give a thumbs up and you're moved to do so, we encourage you to. And then chat, revisiting that again, it's at the bottom of your screen. But in order to allow focus on the discussion, we ask that you don't use this chat for questions. We ask that you instead raise your hand. Do use the chat to talk to Moonshine if you have any issues and to post any resource links that people can follow up on. If you would like to, you could use the chat for a personal conversation and to do so you click on the name and it'll show you a drop down of all the participants and you select the person you wanna to talk to privately. But again, contrary to what people think, Multitasking just isn't a thing. So we encourage you to stay focused with the conversation. And again, if you have any questions or technical issues, talk to with Becca in the chat. The timer, Sarah, is uh, gonna keep us on schedule. So whether you're asking questions or answering one, you're gonna get a maximum of a minute. When you have 15 seconds left, Sarah will put a screen up that lets you know that there's 15 seconds left. Now we're gonna move into Juliana, letting us know about your choice of being on record or off record. Did it again, always forget the mute. Good afternoon, everyone. Today's conversation is going to be recorded for future use. Uh, in typical traditional journalistic, journalistic fashion, we're gonna use on record and off the record. You are more than welcome to speak off the record. Uh, despite being this recorded um, today, should you like your comments to not be on record just before you make them, simply say, this is off the record and we will keep it out of any video um, and reporting that we do. That being said, let's move on to a brief rundown of the agenda. Our runtime today is slated to be an hour and 15 minutes, including a little background on how this conversation came to be. Um, from 310 to 325, we'll welcome our panel of experts. 
Each will have three minutes to introduce themselves and share brief updates on some of the latest information pertaining to wildlife season. Today, we're happy to welcome Placer County Supervisor Cindy Gustafson, CAL FIRE Unit Chief Brian Estes, North Tahoe Fire Protection District Chief Bar Michael Schwartz, Truckee Fire Protection District Chief Bill Celine. And from 325 to 345, Moonshine and Inc. will have our own question and answer session with members of the region's fire and emergency personnel who will each have one minute to reply. These include the remaining experts that we're sharing today. Um, Lieutenant Paul Long of the Placer County Sheriff's Office, Detective Robert Womack from Truckee PD, Lisa Heron from US Forest Service and Tahoe Living with Fire, Holly Powers from the Placer County OEM, Carly Murphy from Placer County Resource Conservation District, Michael Romero from Placer County Health and Human Services, and Luana Dowling from Placer County Fire Safe Allowance, Alliance. Excuse me. Uh, from 3.45 to 4.10, our audience members, our public guests today, will have their own opportunity to ask questions. Questions will be fielded on a first come, first served basis. And please don't forget to use your virtual, not your physical hand to ask questions. Our panel members will have one minute, one minute to respond. I'll now hand the mic back to Alex for some background on how fire season is already shaping up this season. Yes, shaping up indeed. So some recent fires in the kind of somewhat area, the Quail Fire over in Solano County, which is about 135 miles west of here. Um, it's inactive as of June 10th, but it did end up affecting over 1800 acres and destroyed three structures. And then the Grant Fire, which is uh, it was still active as of yesterday and expected containment is today. That has affected over 5,000 acres and both of them, the causes are under investigation. Uh, it is June 15th. We are officially in fire season, which normally runs June through September, but it can go as late as November. So currently, uh, before this winter, we had two pretty wet winters, meaning there was lots of growth of vegetation. Uh, however, this has been a dry winter. So in, in kind of as things stand now, the match is kind of ready to be struck. 2020 started out with the driest February since 1864, which was during the Civil War. Uh, we did end up having a wetter March, which was helpful. But there is an increasing fire danger posed by dead grass and the hot and dry conditions we're in. Amador El Dorado Unit Chief Scott Lindegren says we've already we're already above average for fire ignitions for this time of year. And illegal campfires are the leading cause of wildfires in the Tahoe Basin. Because of that, last year, Truckee Fire implemented an open burning ban, which was followed suit by other districts. And it basically means that you can't burn anything other than gas. So put away your charcoal barbecues. And that fire ban is in effect as of today, as of like 12.01 this morning. Uh, what is permissible are outdoor gas devices, including campfires, gas fire pits, gas barbecues, and pellet burning devices. Gas is good, other stuff is not so good. Uh, during red flag or critical fire weather conditions, all sources of open flames, including the natural gas and propane outdoor fire pits and barbecues, uh, as well as pellet grills and smokers are prohibited. Uh, many people may know that the town of Truckee has an alert system using Nixel. Typically, communities have a 10 to 12% opt-in rate for such systems. Truckee has over 50%, which does show the community-mindedness of our region. Now, all of that being said, COVID-19 is still here. We're still in a pandemic. And so top of our mind as journalists is 
how is this crisis going, how is the COVID crisis going to affect Tahoe during potential emergencies? And that's one of the reasons we're, we're all gathered here today. So some of the questions uh, that are kind of circulating our thoughts are, are virtual workers going to swell our full-time ranks of people living here consistently? Uh, and with more people in town, will that mean that our communication infrastructure is challenged? And in the event of an evacuation, do we have to bring our masks? So enough of me babbling. I'm going to turn it over to the people you all came to see. I will go ahead and start things off with uh, Placer County Supervisor Cindy Gustafson and just a gentle and very friendly reminder that you do have three minutes and we're going to keep you to it. Great. I started my timer, Alex, so correct me if I go long. And I want to thank, first off, Moonshine Inc. This is the second one of your talks that I've participated in and I think it's such a great forum uh, for everyone to learn from our experts, which is not me. So I know you're here to hear from our, our first responders and our fire chiefs and want to thank um, uh, Cal Fire Nevada Yuba Placer Unit and our Placer County Fire Department Chief Brian Estes, uh, Chief Schwartz and Chief Celine for, for being here and taking the time to help educate our public as well. And while much of everyone's focus has been on COVID over the last few months, um, as you all know, this is going to be um, a very difficult fire season. It's already been very active and the predictions are um, a very serious situation in our forest um, this season. So first off, I just wanna plead with everyone to please be sure to take care of your defensible space and make sure your property is as prepared as possible. And just like with COVID, it's personal responsibility. It's really taking care of our own homes so that we can better take care of uh, everyone in our communities. So at the elected level on um, policy issues is what I'll speak a bit about and that is on fire insurance um, and fire insurance cancellations. This continues to be a huge challenge and I've heard from many in our community and Placer County is working diligently with our state insurance commissioner, Laura, and our state legislatures to do whatever we can to help in this um, situation. It has really been a crisis um, for the last two years uh, for sure and, and even predating that. We continue to fight for that. We're tracking state legislation. I've testified on a couple of the pieces of state legislation. We'll continue to track that and advocate for you, our citizens and our uh, residents. I also serve on the Placer County Fire Ad Hoc Committee that looks at um, not only our Placer County fire zones, but also looks at our fire fund, trying to ensure equity with resources and call volumes throughout, the, uh, throughout Placer County. We want to ensure that residents are substantially investing in sustainable fire services for their community. Um, and it's throughout the county that it is a, a true danger for us all. Um, also, I wanted to commend our many local communities for their efforts on FireWise community. I know uh, Luana's on the phone as well, um, Luana Dolling, and our FireWise communities now, Placer County, I think is second in the state with the most number of FireWise communities. And many of our East Slope areas, Carnelian Woods, Alpine Meadows, Squaw Valley, Martis, Lahontan, and Dollar Point are all there. And my timer went off. One more quick comment. Hazardous Vegetation Ordinance. Um, in April, the Board of Supervisors adopted a new Hazardous Vegetation Ordinance, uh, asking people to abate on their both vacant and improved parcels, and we will be working to enforce that. So with that, Alex, I'll turn it back. Sorry, I went a few seconds over. <laughs> it's okay, thank you for the timer. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Super Supervisor Gustafson. Chief Estes, we'll turn the time over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Alex and Becca. And um, boy, you, you guys run a tight ship. I, I really appreciate uh, the tight timing on that. I do not want to have my timer go off like it did for the supervisor. So I'm going to try to make this succinct. But again, thank you for, uh, for the invitation. My name is Brian Estes. I'm the Cal Fire Unit Chief for the Nevada Yuba Placer Unit and also the Fire Chief for the Placer County Fire Department. And it's really an honor to be here, you know, with some of my partners, Chief Celine, 
um, and Chief Schwartz in particular, as well as our law enforcement partners, because I think one of the themes you're going to hear throughout today is the fact that without the collaboration of the east side agencies, um, th th there's no way that we could um, meet the mitigation measures. Uh, any one agency cannot do it alone. So real quickly, as, as we're coming into 2020 in the fire season, uh, we are, as you said earlier, we do already have a declared fire season. We did ban residential burning today, which coincides with the local ordinances on the east side. Um, and as Supervisor Gutsison said, we will be managing uh, and, and um, taking on the workload of the Placer County Hazardous Vegetation Ordinance, um, which, which is just going to piggyback onto the Public Resources Code 4291 and really try to highlight our efforts for prevention um, and, and encouraging homeowners to, to do their part to help us in defense of their homes and property. Last year, we saw almost 8,000 uh, wildland fires across the state uh, in what we call the state responsibility area. Um, that, was, that was down a little bit in our acres of, of uh, just shy of 300,000 acres burned statewide uh, was down. But that's not to, to say that we are not looking at a potentially um, significant uh, season. We did have a much drier uh, winter than, than we, would, we would have hoped for. Uh, as of May 1st, we had about 59% of our snowpack in the Sierras. And that's gonna, um, that's gonna allow us to uh, be into some more significant burning conditions earlier into the year. So instead of those wet years where maybe we were uh, September, October, November, I think we're gonna start to see some significant uh, activity here within the next month. And as, um, as uh, was said earlier, we're already seeing that in the front country in the grasslands as was identified by the Grant Fire just two days ago. Um, our peak staffing for CAL FIRE on the state side uh, will be at full staffing on June 22nd, which for the east side will equate to our two engine companies at uh, Station 50 in Truckee, which we co-locate with the Truckee Fire Protection District as well as our co-location with North Tahoe in Carnelian Bay. Across the unit, we have 22 engine companies, nine hand crews, three bulldozer units, and our full load of uh, aircraft at the Grass Valley Air Attack Base. So um, we are looking at an above average season. And I, and I think that um, one of the things I'm really looking forward to is the continued collaboration with our east side partners, both fire, law enforcement, and OES to ensure that um, we operate in the most effective and efficient manner possible. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to you, Alex. Perfect. I think you came in under three minutes too, so good job. Yeah, just me. <laughs> awesome. All right, Chief Schwartz, you are up. All right, well, I'll take his extra two minutes. <laughs> All right, I, I'm starting my timer. Um, so first, a little bit about COVID-19 uh, for North Tahoe Fire. We remain uh, still with face coverings while at work, um, while uh, our fire inspections and our fire prevention officers are fully functional. They're taking appointments online um, and our operational staffs are fully operational. All stations, uh, all five stations are staffed along with CAL FIRE in, in Crystal Bay. Um, fighting fire this year is gonna be different. Um, we're preparing our people to spend less time in base camps, uh, more time uh, as a single unit, um, using what they like to call coyote tactics, which is, means they're spiking out sometimes, not always going back. So a little bit more rural type firefighting than they maybe they're used to in um, some of our California fires. Um, and very much working as a family unit so that to, as to not get exposures in camp. So levels of challenges um, going forward. Um, Kind of switching subjects a little bit um, on the uh, fire insurance and cancellations. Um, you know, if people are canceled, please check our website. We have a lot of good information as this plaster. Um, we do still get calls almost on a daily basis. The good news is all the stuff that you're doing to get your house ready for wildfire will help you maintain your fire insurance. So keep that in mind. Yes, we're in critical fire weather. We have red flag on the on the eastern on the Sierras uh, Sierra front. Um, just by way of facts, 80% of the fires within the basin um, are human caused. The number one cause still remains unattended campfires. And I think that's something that we should be able to improve. Um, and I'm hoping these fire restrictions that have went into place today will um, help with that. Um, you know, obviously in 2007, the Angora fire was a big wake up here. We'd had other fires, um, but the Angora was our most significant. And since that time, 
um, we have band together as a coalition um, and started treating properties within the basin, both state and local um, and federal lands. And uh, really we've treated nearly 100% of the initial treatments in all the undeveloped area right adjacent to people's homes. Doesn't mean there's not still lots of need attention, but the, that WUI interface zone has been pretty well um, done. Uh, going back to what Chief Estes said about um, working together, interesting, you know, we have some software we use so that we can communicate with each other. Um, this year, uh, that uh, Incline Village Fire, so North Lake Tahoe, our, our sister department for North Tahoe, uh, has joined our common dispatch with Grouse Grass Valley, which is Cal Fires and Truckees. So that brings more, three more station staff um, resources into our uh, radio system, which allows for much quicker reflex times to fire. So a real good thing this year for everybody. Um, and we really welcome Chief Summers and North Lake Tahoe Fire to our um, dispatch system. Um, Defensible space inspections. Since Angora, there's been over 40,000 defensible space inspections done within the basin. Um, last year, North Tahoe Fire did over 2,000 of those. Um, all of again, is all that information is shared um, throughout. And I'm a little just about finished up my time, so I think I'll just finish on um, right now that we have a program in it, Timber Environmental Impact Report out. It's for treating uh, 17,000 acres along the West Shore. Uh, it's in partnership with CAL FIRE and it's out for public comment. So I'd really uh, have people like people take a look at it and give us your feedback. If you like it, let us know. Uh, it really will help us increase our pace and scale of fuel treatments along the West Shore. And I'm going to end right there. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Last but certainly not least, Chief Celine. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks, Chief. Great information. Um, we and our partner agencies, of course, are focused on implementing a robust prevention program. And I know some of you uh, participate in uh, different aspects of this, but I just wanted to take a minute um, to dovetail on the two chiefs and talk about a couple of the areas, actually four key areas that uh, all the local fire districts participate in that maybe some of you are familiar with, but I think they can uh, make us feel better that um, there is a lot of work being done, uh, especially if you measure it on a year to year basis. Uh, first, reducing fuel on the large pieces of land, uh, especially uh, I can speak for around Truckee, but it's similar to most of the local fire districts uh, that are near homes in the WUI. That's a priority for us. Right now in the Truckee area, there are at least five big one to 2,000 acre fuel reduction projects in progress. Um, a couple examples, U.S. Forest Service is reducing fuel on about 2,000 acres south of Sierra Meadows called the Big Jack East Project that some of you may have heard about. Um, and we're seeing, uh, you know, benefit this season uh, from that work. Truckee Fire is working with land managers to implement an 800 acre fuel and fire break east of the airport that will help protect the Glenshire area. Uh, the town is uh, currently today spending a million dollars to reduce fuels in the Tahoe Donner uh, area along roadways to make evacuations safer. Um, and we could go on and on about the different uh, big fuel projects in uh, the North Tahoe area, but all of these projects will reduce the likelihood and intensity of a wildfire uh, in our area. Um, defensible space, you know, another big focus that was mentioned before uh, in Truckee Fire with the help of CAL FIRE and our HOA certified inspectors, we did over 3,000 inspections last year and we're on pace to do that again this year. And of course, that's an important component to uh, get out there, see what's on the ground, and educate uh, the property owners. Uh, disposal of the material is always a challenge, uh, but we and other agencies each year develop a number of low cost and free ways to uh, get rid of that vegetation. Uh, this season, if you haven't heard about it, uh, there are free dumpsters, free drop-off, chipping available. Um, and of course, in the Truckee area, there's uh, two more Friday free drop-off days at the rodeo grounds. Uh, so take advantage of that. Um, last year, we told you about a program that encourages neighborhoods and neighbors to take action uh, that the supervisor mentioned called Firewise Communities. Uh, even some insurance company uh, and insurance carriers are recognizing that. I'm glad to report in the Truckee area, we went from four last year certified neighborhoods to 19 certified neighborhoods and a few more uh, in the works. So really uh, proud to talk about the neighborhoods that uh, are engaged in this process. And I know there's many in the North Tahoe, North Star, uh, Squaw Valley as well areas. And thank you, Luana, for all your work on that. Um, campfire ban, of course, was mentioned that went into uh, effect today. Uh, I'm not going to say anything else about that. But just in closing, I did want to mention that, uh, you know, you should all uh, feel good that we have a local uh, wildfire response 
uh, that is very robust. We're, being, we're in this converging area of federal, state, and local lands with corresponding fire agencies that are ready to pounce on a fire, um, mutual aid agreements that we can tap into with almost an unlimited supply of fire resources if we need it. Um, we're fortunate to have aircraft and helicopters and, uh, and those things within a 15 minute uh, flight of us. So of course, in closing, when the weather is right and we're in red flag conditions, think high winds, uh, of course, if a fire starts, there may be no stopping it, and we will all be scrambling just to get people out of the way. So uh, the message is pay attention and uh, be ready to go on those red flag days. Thanks, Alex. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all um, for your words and also your work involved with all of that. Okay, so we're going to jump over to question and answer time. And Moonshine itself is going to start off. We have a couple of questions to kick things off. Um, before we get into that, just again, wanted to call attention to the other emergency and fire personnel who are on the call and ready to answer. So again, in addition to the chiefs and supervisor Gustafson, we will also have answers ideally from the Placer County Sheriff's Office, Placer County Health and Human Services, Truckee PD, Placer County Office of Emergency Services, the County Resource Conservation District, Fire Safe Alliance, U.S. Forest Service, and Tahoe Living with Fire. So um, for those responding to questions, please state your name and office, and you will have one minute, and again, an eye out for the 15 second remaining uh, slide that will pop up when you get close. All right, so Julie is going to jump in with the first question. Julie, if you're ready. I'm here. Thanks, Alex. Um, I let, just want to remind you all if you do not want your comments on the record, just state off the record. Just a friendly reminder. Uh, so to begin, we outlined some concerns earlier in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic that is still a major concern. What are some of the unique challenges that we face this year in this year's wildlife season amid the crisis? Well, no one's jumping in, so, you know, the elected <laughs> politician will. <laughs> I, I see Brian raised his hand. Oh, did he? I'm sorry. I should have raised my hand. Sorry. No, no. I'll let him go. Okay. Go ahead, Cindy. Well, I was just I was quickly going to say for all of us in a tourism uh, location, um, it's always a challenge educating visitors and uh, on how to be in our, our Tahoe community. Um, I just was on a Zoom call with, again, the North Lake Tile Resort Association on some of the efforts we're taking uh, to educate visitors on safe practices when they're here related to COVID primarily. But those are some of the same practices we've used with changeable message signs and other things that the fire districts have prepared for. So I'm gonna let them speak to it, but I'm here to listen and learn and, and open to suggestions from the community um, as well. Thank you. Um, Brian, do you want to take it from there? Yes, I'll, 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 I'll kind of mention a little bit where, where Cal Fire at a state level is working on this. And, and this is really kind of um, uncharted ground that, that all the, the fire and emergency services agencies are, are working in. Um, it's very common, you know, when we get into these large damaging wildfires, um, besides the evacuees and um, the displacement of those people into you know, fairgrounds or Red Cross shelters, et cetera. It, it's, it's real common in major fires like the Angora or what we've experienced over the last few years to see a, a, a fairgrounds um, like Gold Country or, um, or any of the large areas in the, in the truck, truck, Tahoe Truckee Basin to have, you know, upwards of 2,500 or 3,000 firefighters um, and support personnel commonly brought in from a very large regional area. So we have one of our type one incident management team, um, incident commanders and, and his staff um, in Southern California that's currently working on some, on some um, concepts. And, and I've been working with OES and with our local HHS 
officials to look at um, how we how we deal with social distancing, how we deal with feeding, um, sleeping, lodging, briefing, some of the things that Chief Schwartz talked about. So it, it is a little bit fluid and it's kind of a work in progress. Um, as soon as we start to see some some outputs from those um, from that work, I will definitely um, share that widespread. Okay, thank you so much. Moving on, how does coordination between partners? Oh, yeah, we have a uh, Lieutenant Long, I believe, was had comments oh, as well. Oh, I didn't see a raised hand. Sorry, <laughs> it's all good. I think I'm unmuted. There we are. Uh, so. Uh, Paul Long from Placer County Sheriff's Office. Our responsibility in the event of a wildfire is uh, limited to evacuations. And uh, obviously COVID-19, does a wildfire evacuation is gonna trump any COVID-19 concerns in terms of getting people moving. But there is something that you actually brought up at the beginning of this that's worth saying, which is uh, in the early stages, in the first 15 minutes, the first half hour of an emergency, we're not going to have infrastructure, receiving infrastructure in place. So usually our goal is to get everyone moving and if they require further services, we try to get uh, people moving to something called an evacuation center where there may not be shelters, but there's just a, an area for people to congregate where we can start sending services in. So you asked about masks. Yes, bring your masks because we can't guarantee in that moment that there'll be anyone to screen, anyone to try to encourage social distancing, anything like that. So definitely, uh, if you have an extra mask, put it in that go bag we encourage you to have by the side of your bed. And uh, if you don't, then please keep one in your car. So and with that, I'm done. Holly, I saw you also had your hand raised, but I'm not seeing it now. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I was just going to, again, hello everyone. Holly Power Assistant Director of Emergency Services for Placer County. I just wanted to uh, go off of Paul's comments there that the evacuation, when you get that order, it doesn't change anything, whether we're in COVID or not. If you get something to get out, it means get out. Um, and the, the part that's really sort of changed is where I'm going to hand it off to Mike Romero from our Health and Human Services Division Department, um, who will talk about what happens after you evacuate and where there may be some changes there. So with that, I'll give it to Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. So um, just to pick up where, uh, where Chief Estes left off, you know, normally when we do sheltering, we do choose a congregate setting, uh, fairgrounds or some of our favorite locations. Um, in, in Tahoe, the, the airport or the North Tahoe Event Center is a wonderful place. But I just uh, met with the Red Cross this weekend and their goal is to not use congregate settings, but in fact, to put people in hotels. So that's new for the Red Cross. It changes the way they do business. Um, they're looking at changes in, and, and for example, food distribution. They're going to distribute a prepackaged food. Um, as uh, as the sheriff's deputy mentioned, um, you know that that evacuation center well it could be a parking lot, that temporary location where people are instructed to go to, and then the Red Cross will coordinate uh, uh, um, uh, transportation and, and a stay at a, at a local hotel. So that's all new for the Red Cross. That's a change in uh, model for health and human services as well. We're there to support the Red Cross uh, where they need help. And um, you can expect that differences uh, this season, this fire season and during the uh, COVID-19 season. Thank you so much. Let's see, anybody else? I don't see any more hands raised, so we'll move on. Um, how does coordination between partners for maximum public involvement work? Public meaning locals, part-time residents, and visitors alike. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> well, I think it's all right. This is too short. Uh, you know, that's a, a very open-ended question. I think that's why nobody's throwing their hands up. Um, this is what you're doing right here. This is community engagement with your local fire resources to get information on how to prepare yourself. And I think that on top of that, we have two large uh, communication networks that we use to communicate with people, um, whether you know, it's the fire pit or the JIC. You know, they're both information centers to get, make sure that everybody's uh, well informed. Um, and then the piece that people do really worry about is how they're going to get notified in a fire. 
and all the agencies have access to multitudes of reasons, whether it's social media, whether it's reverse 911, um, you know, whether it's using the WIA system, which is like Amber Alerts, whether we're using old technology and new technology, uh, we all have access to that shared uh, ability to share information and notify people. So that was a broad answer to a broad question. <laughs> Thank you for that. See, no, any hands? No hands. Alex, we'll turn it back to you. Oh, Holly, I see you. <laughs> and I think one other thing we had sort of mentioned, um, I think all that she's talked about, some of the key community involvement pieces is the Firewise Community Network um, and working through that and really getting into your um, community and working with neighbors to create that defensible space um, to protect yourself, your family, and your neighbors. And within that context is really where you can get involved with your other um, first responder stakeholders. So if you are in any one of the fire districts we've represented here, um, there's a good chance there you're going to be networking and communicating with your local fire district to only increase your knowledge base um, about fire and, and the importance of creating that defensible space, your home hardening and your landscaping, that sort of a thing. Um, so um, this is where I get to put in that good plug of Firewise Communities and really working with your district. And for Placer County, uh, Luana Dowling is our Firewise Community Coordinator. Um, and you can get to her if you go to um, placerfirealliance.org. And I'll throw that in the chat so everyone can see it. We have contact information there. And that's one way to start local with your neighbors and, and grow your network out um, with our first responders here. Thank you so much, Holly. Uh, I see Carly Murphy. Yeah, hi, I'm Carly Murphy. I'm with the Tahoe Resource Conservation District, and I coordinate the Tahoe Network of Fire Adapted Communities. So for anybody within the Tahoe Basin, uh, we're uh, kind of your local resource, and that's tahoelivingwithfire.com. Uh, we also do FireWise, but we also work with communities who aren't interested in pursuing FireWise in its entirety. So. Um, I will also put that link in the chat box. Thank you so much. All right, seeing no others, uh, let's move back to Alex. Take it away. Awesome, okay, so uh, my first question is, what have local agencies seen regarding the effectiveness of the campfire ban? Hey, Alex, Bill Celine here. You know, um, we don't have a lot of history with it uh, in regards to years, but we did put the ordinance in place last year in the Truckee Fire District. And, and I believe uh, all of the neighboring districts have a very similar, if not exact, ban to uh, banning campfires during the CAL FIRE burn suspension time period, which starts, as you said, today through uh, until we get significant moisture, which is uh, usually November. Um, you know, in 2018, prior to implementing the ordinance, we uh, counted 18 escape campfires uh, in the fire district, uh, excuse me, 15, 15 of them in 2018. And then in 2019, last year, we counted only three after the ordinance was in place. So it's sure encouraging information. Of course, it only takes one fire to be the, the bad fire, but um, reducing the volume of fires is uh, definitely beneficial. Thanks, Chief Celine. Anyone else? Local agencies seen regarding the effectiveness of campfire bans. So Chief Schwartz, just a comment. So this is our first year with a complete ban. Uh, we've had a ordinance in place for five years um, that has had restrictions. And to just kind of, uh, so we don't have exact data on what the current ban will do, but from the time Previous to the original uh, restrictions, um, we saw a significantly decrease in illegal, like bonfire type activities. People knew they could call 911, and I think that's probably the reason I wanted to say something. If you see something that's concerned, you know, we're in the see something, say something world, um, report it, call 911, let us go out there and determine if it's safe and legal. Um, what you need to do is if, it, if it's something looks unsafe, is report it to 911 and get us out there moving. Um, because yeah, we've already had a couple of escape campfires this year early, and uh, hopefully this now that the ban's in place, they'll stop. Uh, but anecdotally, for the five years that we've had our restrictions in place, we saw a large decrease in what I would consider illegal or dangerous activity. Uh, 
Okay, I don't see any other raised hands. So I'm going to move to the next question. Okay, so in order of importance, what vital actions can members of the public take, both residents and visitors, to be prepared for wildfire? And that might, you know, defensible space, go bags, et cetera. Chief Estes. Okay, well, I'll start this out and I'm sure my partners will, will, will tag on. But, I, you know, we, we had a really great town hall last week and we, we had almost an identical question to this. And I would say that to me, the number one most important thing for the public to know is that, is that they have to be involved. They have to show personal responsibility and being part of the solution. Um, you know, our, our agency had a, had a slogan about 10 years ago that said, uh, you provide the the defense and we will provide the offense. And I think it was really simple, simplistic, but very effective. And that that's not only home hardening and defensive space, but that's also just, you know, being really aware and, and accessing social media platforms, um, um, accessing information provided from the state of California, local fire districts, from county um, OES, the notification system. And most importantly, getting to know your neighbors and understanding the community you live in so that in the most critical time, you're not reacting, but you're just acting equally for things you've prepared for. Wonderful. Uh, Lieutenant Long, you're up. So um, I'll speak, I'll say two things. The first is uh, for anyone listening to this, congratulations. You're already on the first step to preparing because knowledge is your armament and uh, the the longest journey begins with a single step. Uh, the second thing is this. Um, there's a lot of information. Everyone, everyone on this panel has a critical piece of your defense. And we aggregate a lot of that on websites. So as those websites come out, please make sure you look at them because all our information is repeated on all those websites. From my perspective, preparing you for the day that there's a knock on your door or a reverse notification or uh, perhaps high-low siren tones, which high-low means time to go, um, those uh, for that moment, then there's a couple things I want you to do. The first thing is we use a mass notification called Placer Alert, placeralert.org. That's our fastest uh, way to push information out to the public. It's opt-in, just like Nixle or Code Red, so please sign up for that. And uh, the second thing is when you hear a notice to evacuate, get moving because you're either, uh, the train is leaving the station. You're either on the train or on the tracks. And I know where I want to be. Wonderful. Uh, Holly Powers. Um, I, have, I have three kind of points to hit off uh, for this response coming from the Office of Emergency Services and that general kind of preparedness. Um, and it's really make a plan, build a kit, get involved. It kind of pulls all those little pieces together uh, that everyone's talked about here. And that plan includes how are we communicating between our family members if we're separated, kids are at school, um, my husband's at work, uh, what's that communication plan, who's picking up who and going where. Um, it also includes what Lieutenant Long mentioned. Uh, part of that plan is are we opted in to the appropriate emergency alerts um, that are provided in our community? And what are the other things like the social media channels, that sort of thing that we should be paying attention to um, and including red flag awareness, that sort of a thing. Then your build a kit, Lieutenant Long already mentioned it. So what's in my go bag, my mask, a couple days worth of clothes, make sure you have shoes and underwear. Think of things that you, you know, you really want to have if you're going to be out of your house for a week. Um, and where can I go? And then get involved, which as Lieutenant Long mentioned and a couple others of our, our fire chiefs here, um, first step here, you guys are already getting involved or your firewise community um, are really key components there. So make a plan, build a pit, build a kit and get involved. Um, and a website here that's really helpful uh, is the readyplacer.org. And that's our all community base. Um, we get input from all our fire districts, law enforcement um, cities. And it, that's where we kind of try and congregate as much information about being prepared for before, during and after an emergency. So readyplacer.org, and I'll throw that in the chat. Love it, thanks, Holly. Uh, Chief Schwartz. 
All right. Well, I'll go down the, the, some of the things they've hit. But number one, make advantage, take advantage of your fire districts, your free shipping, your defensible space inspections. Um, there's some incentive programs out there. Look at the websites for each your individual district and take advantage of those. There's also a tremendous information of static in, um, information on those sites. Um, Harden your home for the ember ignition zones. There's a lot of information, but uh, that's basically trying to make your home resistive to wild, approaching wildfire embers. Um, the, uh, we've mentioned Firewise Community, so I am a leader, so join me in, in the leaders group um, and be a leader for your own neighborhood. Um, pay attention to red flag and critical fire danger days and know that you can't burn and those are the days you ought to be prepared. Um, the CAL FIRE app is another good tool that hasn't been mentioned yet, so on top of all, register for your alerts, whether county you're in, whether it's El Dorado Code Red or Placer Alerts or um, you know, whatever it is, make sure you get registered locally. Um, and then lastly, um, don't just have a bag, but make a plan. Have a five minute escape plan and a, a 30 minute evacuation plan and be prepared to use that. You can't just have a bag and, and then not practice getting out. Uh, it takes time and coordination and you need the muscle memory. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. All helpful information. Uh, Mike Romero. Thanks. This is uh, Mike from Public Health. Um, just to add to the, you know, what do you put in, the, in your bag? Well, one of the things that's hard for us to do is, is we can't get you your prescription medications very easily. So I always uh, ask that people um, bring their prescription meds with them. Um, and then, you know, you want to get out as quickly as possible and, and hopefully you can grab your cell phone. Um, but if you don't, or if your phone dies or whatever, what I find is people don't, we don't know our phone numbers to any of our friends or loved ones anymore, right? They're programmed in your cell phone. So, so have a few phone numbers memorized, write them down somewhere so that when you get to that shelter location and you want to let people know that you're okay, you, you don't want to just rely on your cell phone. So, you know, start memorizing a couple important phone numbers. The last thing I'll say is uh, uh, your animals, uh, people, uh, you love your pets so much. Uh, it's very important that you take them with you the first time. Uh, I know the, the um, sheriff, uh, the Lieutenant Long could, could attest that people go back for their pets and it's really, really dangerous. It's dangerous for you. It's dangerous when animal services has to go back on your behalf. So do your best to be able to take your animals with you the first time when you're told to evacuate. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Romero. Um, we're now going to close the expert questions and we're going to move into the audience Q&A. And this is an opportunity for everyone who is participating, including the quote unquote experts, to uh, propose a question with all of these great minds together, um, forming that regional robust response that we have. Um, we will take questions in order of raised hands and for those of you who have not spoken yet, we ask that you give a quick introduction. Your name and place of residence would be fine. And then there's a reminder that there is a one minute limit, whether you're asking a question or answering. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We've got a quick hand raise from Jennifer Montgomery. Let me unmute myself. Hello, Miami. Good to see you. Thank you so much for, for hosting everyone today. I very much appreciate it. Um, one of the things that I am hearing consistently from people is uh, the challenges around doing home hardening work, specifically as relates to the costs. Um, have there been any consideration given by any of the local governments to waive the um, planning department fees for home hardening work specific to fire protection? So we're talking about fees and fire protection fees. Are there any talks around the community about waiving Waving, waiving fees for, for building. For, for building. I'm raising my hand, Mayumi. I can do a quick one. Thank you, Cindy. Let's hear from you. Great to see you, Jennifer. Um, you know, we talked and we did institute for the power safety shutoffs. Um, uh, uh, we waived the generator fees, the fees for uh, installing generators for power. We have not talked more specifically about waiving fees for uh, home hardening. 
but we can certainly consider that. I think it's a great suggestion and certainly one that uh, we could look at from Placer County's perspective. And that would be wonderful, Cindy. Thank you. And, and specifically, I'm thinking about the fees for uh, replacing windows with double pane windows, which are much more fire resistant, re-roofing. Um, I don't think there's any fees associated with uh, vents, but I know there is with uh, uh, tearing out and constructing a new deck. So th those are some of the things that I would really encourage local government to think about waiving the fees to help incentivize people to do that work. All right, um, Chief Schwartz, it looks like you have your hand raised to answer as well. I did just, and I think a lot of it got covered, but um, one, I just wanted to let people know, first I gotta say hi to Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Second is um, a lot of the stuff that's home hardening is really inexpensive and doesn't require permits. Um, it's really when you get to the, the more extensive pieces, uh, windows, if you're gonna reside or do a re-roof, those are expensive, but the majority of the stuff you can do, is simple, like you know, keeping the pine needles away from your house, um, putting up the you know, eighth inch mesh screening on your vents, you can do that yourself. It's very inexpensive, um, doesn't require permits. And so um, I think it's a good suggestion on some of those large things. And I think as um, legislature will come out with some bills this year, that's gonna either further encourage some home hardening activities, maybe rebates and stuff, we might see a, a surge and that would be a, a really appropriate request I think for the districts, if we do have fees attached to those, but once again, most of the stuff I think does not require fees um, to do home hardening activities. Thank you, Chief Schwartz. Um, Carly, I saw that you raised your hand and I just wanted to make sure if you wanted to answer um, Jennifer Montgomery's question or if you yeah. were. Yes, um, I just wanted to put a little plug out there. We're working on a home retrofit guide right now. It's being published through the University of Nevada and University of California Cooperative Extensions. And we'll be doing a public workshop on July 28th. And we're really hoping to talk specifically about um, things that people can do easily to their home and um, also kind of helping people prioritize based on costs as well. So um, that will be fully advertised in the Tahoe Live, on the Tahoe Living with Fire website once we have all the details, but tentatively scheduled for July 28th. And I'll put that link in the chat box again. Excellent, thank you, Carly. And I wanna let everybody know that if you do put a hyperlink into the chat box, we will send that out to the follow-up email um, with the video and all the links and follow-up recap. So do include your links. I think these are important resources for people to have at the ready and uh, direct URLs are very helpful. Um, I think that wraps up that question. I am going to move to Nicole from the Sierra Corps, who I believe has a question. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Luskamore. I'm a resident um, of Tahoe City and I also work for the Sierra Nevada Alliance um, as the Sierra Corps Forestry Fellowship Program Director and I also serve on uh, North Tahoe Regional Advisory Council to Cindy Gustafson and formerly Jennifer Montgomery. So lots of friendly faces. Um, I had two brief questions. The first one is um, I've been talking to I guess friends and community members about 4th of July and the fact that all of the fireworks shows have been canceled. Well, that's what I thought. So first part, I guess, is it, are all the fireworks shows still canceled? And then is there concern that because there's no official fireworks shows, visitors might bring their own illegal fireworks to the region to do some kind of celebration, increasing the risk of some kind of accident fire starting? Um, and obviously, you know, um, telling people they're not allowed to would be the easiest way to try to prevent that, but any other additional efforts around that concern with 4th of July and personal fireworks? Yes, I think it's a great question, Nicole, and I know that they had um, fireworks out at the airport this past weekend, so we know they're happening. Oh. Um, no, but it was, it was actually san sanctioned. It was in celebration of yeah. high school seniors, but um, it's just good to put this question out there. Um, Chief Estes. Yes, thank you. Uh, so Brian Estes, CAL FIRE Unit Chief and Placer County Fire Chief. Um, so great question. I, I think I'm going to answer that in two parts real quickly. Number one, um, you know, we're really looking at uh, obviously the um, stages of the county and their opening, really any kind of large congregate groups like firework displays and things are going to probably fall into that stage four. So when we've seen things like the Colfax celebration or other small specific 
gatherings. Um, those have largely been canceled and the, and the support of them by fire and law enforcement have largely been under HHS health orders and the state's health orders. But shifting gears to the concern about maybe an increase in individual fireworks, we are gonna be working with our law enforcement partners and fire service partners in the Truckee Basin around the 4th of July as we did last year on, on some fireworks interdiction. Um, really the message there is about prevention and, and we're, we're, we're already making it widespread that, that we are gonna be up there and we are gonna be um, looking at trying to stop or reduce the amount of illegal fireworks that are being trafficked into California uh, for use. And so we will be up there for about a week at the Truckee Ag Station. Excellent, that's good to know. Chief Celine. Yeah, thanks, Miami. And uh, just to uh, dovetail on Chief Essie's comments that we are worried about uh, illegal fireworks. And I think um, Chief Swartz said earlier, you know, when you see something, say something, and uh, we hope people call 911 and we can uh, get after those. As far as the fireworks display at the airport, um, as you pointed out, that was a permitted uh, fireworks display, and it's the only one that we know of uh, that's permitted in the areas, all others, because they create um, an unmanaged gathering, especially not necessarily the fire danger um, have been canceled that we know of. Thank you. Holly, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I think this is Holly Powers with the Placer County Office of Emergency Services. And on the Placer County side, um, OES helps manage the application for permitted fire work production. And there is a 60 day period um, you have to apply for for anyone that wants to have a larger fireworks show. Um, and so currently we don't have any active 4th of July um, permits at this time. Um, and that's largely to everything that has already been mentioned. Um, but. So I just wanted to mention that too on the Placer County side. Thank you, Holly. I think we are ready for our next community question. And um, I know that Sarah Smith was looking to ask her question. So Sarah, if you'd like to unmute yourself and get up there and Lynn, I'll come to you next. <laughs> unmute. Hi everybody, my name is Sarah Smith. I'm with the Truckee Arts Alliance and Truckee Cultural District and I am an area fine artist. Um, my question has to do with um, whether there is a social media specific outreach plan for information regarding everything from um, preparedness for um, wildfire as well as prevention, things like campfire bans, um, you know, uh, let's see here, uh, the, the available alerts and resources, being able to get information out there to, to people specifically on social media simply because so many people are online right now, including so many of our visitors and so many of our now becoming much more long-term visitors as people are kind of migrating up here and, um, and wanting to uh, stay here as opposed to, um, you know, in the city and so we, we've got folks that um, may not have encountered things like a campfire ban and they come to Tahoe and think ah oh, it's so romantic to have a campfire without the acknowledgement that it's not very romantic to start a wildfire um, so as an artist in the arts community I'll wrap this up really quickly I just wanted to suggest if there's an interest in say uh, creating some kind of a visual um, poster a contest or something like that that gets those soundbite messages out there that people can blast out amplifier style, um, then um, just uh, let me know and I can help facilitate that through the arts community. Thank you, Sarah, for your continual community mindedness in uh, speaking with art. Um, so the question is about social media outreach. Is there a concerted, maybe coordinated effort um, in the land of social media? I'm guessing um, next door is one of the ones that people would probably be looking for. Um, looks like, see Nicole putting, is this in response to the question, Nicole? Do you wanna um, speak and share with the, the call and find you? From my chat, is that? Yes. Oh, it was kind of just a, an idea to piggyback on the question I had asked. Um, that if maybe the county and fire agencies could somehow combine forces to send a notice to short-term rental companies um, that they could share with guests upon arrival 
about the risk of fireworks around 4th of July, like maybe the two weeks around 4th of July and just, you know, really try to emphasize that how risky it is and, and get that word directly to um, visitors. Excellent idea, going directly to source. And looks like um, Holly, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that actually um, OES, the Sheriff's Office, CAL FIRE, um, we just started meeting to discuss this um, precisely on how we kind of leverage each and each and every one of our different social media platforms, such as Facebook, Twitter, Nextdoor, um, and, and the plethora that's out there and really push those key components of messaging um, that we are all responsible for and have, have a part in. Um, we're looking at doing a lot of projects together um, and pieces that would all play off of, um, you know, we have this, how do we prepare our home and get it ready? Um, what happens during an evacuation and what happens during a sheltering and then how we kind of communicate that across, um, across the different platforms that we all own. So that, that's, that planning has started um, to leverage everything that we're, we're doing across the board and the different communities that we hit with our um, platforms. And um, definitely looking, I think that community involvement idea is a wonderful idea, finding different ways to bring that in. Um, and we do have a vested interest in our Tahoe community because we know about the visiting impacts that has up there and how do we get that kind of flash messaging up um, for the people who maybe not, don't know what Placer Alert is and how do I sign up for messaging. Um, we've talked about partnering with um, the short-term rentals, Airbnb, um, our, uh, land uh, ownerships um, to see if we can get some of that messaging posters typed out. So actively working that. So many avenues of communication these days. Um, Carly, I see that you have a response. Yeah, so um, in Tahoe, the fire public information team have, uh, manages Tahoe Living with Fire. Um, and we have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for folks living in the Tahoe Basin. Um, that's Tahoe Living with Fire. And this certainly wouldn't be used during an evacuation or for in the moment um, information. We mostly share preparedness and prevention type information, forest health information. Um, but that being said, I think it's a great platform to follow and then um, also following your local fire district and sheriff um, with it, they'll, that will be extremely helpful in the moment during evacuations. And it looks like a couple of the partners are probably raising their hands to talk about that specifically, so. Excellent, all right, partner Schwartz, if you'd like to <laughs> tell on that. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to fly at 30,000 feet here because Placer is one of six counties in the basin. We have, you know, Nevada County and Truckee and I have an El Dorado piece and my friends in Washoe and Douglas and Carson. So it's super important that we fly super high on this issue. So we've joined, we've joined in partnership with, you know, Tahoe Living with Fire, with the Fire Adaptive Community Network are two really large groups. Um, all the different fire agencies, their local agencies, as well as the state and federal partners have their joint teams. And a lot of their members are on here. Um, pick up the, uh, some of the links on there. And I love the suggestion, um, kind of working towards with some of our local artists. Um, and that's something the people that are on this phone call can listen to and say, hey, maybe that's something we want to do. I really like the suggestion. But the, the reality is super complex, right? Two states, six counties, um, federal, local state. So um, fly really high on this. Uh, um, you can just subscribe to multiple things, not just your next door. Um, but we all have social media out there, all the agencies. And, um, you know, I just, I just find myself subscribing to everything. Thank you, Chief. And I see a comment from um, Lindsay Romack, who is um, on the line, and she's actually serving as Cindy Gustafson's proxy since Cindy had to step off. Would you like to share what you put in the chat there, Lindsay? Sure. Thank you, Mayumi. I just wanted to follow up on Nicole's question um, that, yes, uh, definitely Placer County can reach out to all of our lodging properties and just make sure everybody is aware of the ban. So whether they're in short-term rentals or staying in a hotel, we can get that messaging out. So good suggestion, thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, we're about four minutes out from where we're gonna close down audience Q&A. So um, I'm gonna let a few more people ask questions, but I'm gonna limit it to the first or second expert panel to um, answer the question, unless there is a vehement response. So. Quick, raise your hand if you want to answer a question coming up. And um, just a reminder, I'm going to try to write, wrap this up around 4.10. Lynn Larson. 
I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay, Lynn Larson, I'm the uh, Firewise Chair for my neighborhood. It's been a big success. This question was for Cindy, but I guess Lindsay Womack can answer that. Um, can, is there, how can we find out as, about the hazardous vegetation policy that Cindy mentioned? I can follow up with that. <laughs> uh, Lynn, I can, I can send you a link uh, to the county's website, or I can post it in chat or share it with uh, Miami. So that way you have more information, everybody on this call does, about the new ordinance that went into effect on May 21st. I think that would be the easiest way. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Aaron, you're with uh, North Tahoe Fire. Did you have a response for this or was it for a, a previous question? I apologize, I did not call on you before. And I'm asking you to unmute, there you go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it was actually um, in regard to the messaging, I wanted to um, also include, uh, we re received two, t uh, two sign trailers um, through TOT funds, and so we're able to deploy those if we have emergency messaging. We were able to use those to notify um, people coming in on 267 and on 89 of our fire restrictions and they were extremely effective. So we will be um, deploying those again for this fire season and, um, and have them available um, mobile if, uh, if anyone else needs them, um, should there be an emergency, et cetera. But it's great just for the fire restriction piece if nothing else. Yeah, and it's very immediate. Thank you, Erin. Um, Maria Kiss from KTKE, looks like you have a question. Hi, um, I just wanted to remind everybody not to forget about the local radio station, because um, if the power goes out, people can't charge their phones, so they use it as needed, um, call family members, neighbors, etc. cetera. So um, we had t talked with the fire department a few years ago about, about having a connection for emergency alerts. Um, I haven't heard more from that, but our signal in the car goes, you know, from Sierraville all the way down to, you know, past South Lake. Um, so, you know, we have the basin covered as far as getting messaging and out, messaging out and just wanted to remind people of that. Um, Cause like you said, everybody not, might not know the site to go to. Radio is right now. Um, fire is so important to us. Um, JD gets certified every year so that he can go out on the scene when needed. Um, so yeah, just uh, reminding you that all you need is a battery or a car and you can listen to the radio no matter what's going on. Yes, the immediacy and the resiliency of radio is there, yes. and it's um, true. Uh, Paul Long, looks like you would like to respond to this. Uh, to, more to amplify it, uh, Paul Long from the Sheriff's Office. Uh, yes, not only, absolutely agree, and it's actually in our pre-plan. We're holding a training for our sergeants locally on Wednesday, and one of those discussions is going to be the emergency alert system, the federal system that ties into local radio, cable, and TV and uh, also a couple of phone numbers for local radio stations that an incident commander or their designee may want to call even before the emergency alert system has taken effect so we can start getting the message out. Thank you, Paul. And uh, before I move to Chief Celine, I just want to um, point Maria to the chat where it looks like Donner Summit is not getting the signal for KTKE, so that would be one we thing. That we stream all around the world. Just get download the free app and stream us in anywhere. Right. In the <laughs> that's all we could do gotcha all right oh, Celine. yeah i was just going to quickly say that uh, we are coordinated with uh, ktke uh, through the nixel system so when fire commanders get on scene and they give uh, important immediate information uh, whether it's evacuation or just updates on smoke uh, that information is also picked up by ktke so they get that information uh, real time mm -hmm. all right thank you Celine. Um, all right, we are going to wrap up today's talks. I heard quite a few um, recurring themes coming up, you know, preparedness, um, lines of communication, the fact that we have a really um, big chance of a heavy fire season this year. So this talk comes at no better time. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to Placer County for being an excellent and hardworking partner for today's forum. And I did not talk about this quote at the beginning, but it feels um, like a great way to wrap this up. This is a quote that was in a piece um, that we released last year. 
It's from Detective Robert Womack, Truckee PD. And he said, have a plan, go early. You'd rather be at the front of that pack than at the back. And I think no more salient message could be heard from the people that were speaking today. Get prepared, practice, and be ready. And share this with your neighbors and friends and family. Again, this call will be released as a video and all participants who signed up will be emailed a link. We will include the links that were shared in the group chat. And if you need to get on that list, if you just showed up today and we're not on the list um, and we don't have your email, please email tahotalks at moonshineinc.com and we'll be sure to get you the recap and the video. We would love if everybody would let us know how we did today via a survey that we will include in that email. And um, visit moonshineinc.com slash Tahoe Talks for more on these community conference calls. We've had posted four of them thus far, and they touch on great topics, important topics, such as short-term rentals, businesses in the time of COVID, and direct from the medical experts, what does coronavirus mean for us? All right, so we're gonna see you guys next time. Meanwhile, do everything you can to keep Tahoe smart. Thank you for participating.